Welcome to Mathematics 4. This semester we're going to be discussing a type of mathematics called differential equations. Can you, if you can hear me, please post a message in the chat just to let me know that you're receiving my voice. Okay, thank you. Today I'm going to start by giving some information about this course. Then I'm going to cover four topics. An introduction to differential equation. I'm going to give some examples. I'm going to explain how to draw a direction field. And then I'm going to talk about solving the differential equations that we discussed in section 1.2. I'm expecting that I'm going to be giving you 12 lectures on this course, 14 weeks of term, probably one week will be um, for the term exam, probably one week we will lose due to national holiday, so that comes down to 12 classes. I'm expecting to, yes, what is your question? I'm expecting to lecture for approximately 60 minutes and then I will be available to answer your questions. You don't have to use the whole two hours. If there's not a full hour of questions, we can finish early, that's fine. But let's work under the assumption that we're online for two hours. I say I'm going to approx lecture for approximately 60 minutes, but some weeks I might be a little bit longer than 60 minutes. Some weeks I might be a little bit less than 60 minutes, but that's fine. I'll try to do a 60 minute lesson. I've broken up the material in this course into five topics. First topic, we're going to do an introduction. We'll talk about some examples of differential equations. We'll talk about direction fields. Those we'll do this week. Classification, we'll talk about next week. Section two is about first order differential equations. Then we'll talk about second and higher order differential equations. We will talk about the Laplace transform and we'll finish by talking about systems of first order linear differential equations. And I'm expecting to break the material up like this. Those of you who are saying you have two classes at the same time, I suggest you um, Pick a course that you want to follow live and then watch the videos for the other course at a later, later time when it's convenient for you. If you send an email to me with your details, then if necessary, I can mark you as attended even though you're not attending. Don't worry about this problem, just make sure as long as you are studying for both courses. So back to the slides, I'm expecting to spend three weeks talking about the introduction and about first order equations. And then I'll spend three weeks talking about second and high order linear equations, three weeks talking about the Laplace transform, and then three weeks talking about systems. Because I want to break it up like this, this is why some weeks will have a slightly longer lesson and some weeks will have a slightly shorter lesson. I have lecture notes for this course. You can find them through the OLEARN platform. At the moment, they're not completely finished, so I suggest you wait a few weeks before printing them out if you want to print them out. But they're there if you want them, if you want to read ahead of, if you want to read the material before the lesson or if you want to reread it afterwards. Let me talk briefly about 
exams and homework for this course. I want to note that everything, all the information on this page might change depending on what the university decides. For example, we might have to make the final exam worth 70% of this course, depending on what the people in the charge of the university decide. And then the homework would be 15% and the midterm exam would be 15%. I will let you know at a later date. For the homework, we're not using Pearson website, we're going to use OLAN. I'm going to be making multiple choice tests each week, starting from next week, and each test will be available for you for seven days. So the first one will open next Thursday, and then you'll have seven days to answer the questions. And I'm going to try to make this, these questions not too difficult. I want you this to just I want you to be able to check if you're understanding the material as we go along. The homework should be easier than the exam questions. This is just to get you to think about the material each week. The midterm exam um, will be online on OLAN. This will be either in the eighth week or the ninth week of term, so it's either seven or eight weeks later from now. Again, I'll let you know nearer the time. Final exam, we don't know what we're doing yet. This might be online, it might be in a classroom exam. Some people at this university really want you to have to do classroom exams. Some people at the university want you, um, Turkish students to have to do a classroom exam and foreign students to be allowed to do online exams. I would be surprised if we, have, if we do classroom exams. I think they will probably do that online, but we have to wait for um, the rector and the dean to make their decisions. How much should you be studying for this course? If this was a course in a classroom, the usual rule is that every hour of lesson, you have, you're expected to study another one or two hours outside of class. So if this was a classroom course, we would have four hours of lectures every week. And then you would be expected to spend another four to eight hours studying outside of class. For an online course like this, you're still going to be expected to study the same number of hours. So you're still going to be expected to study somewhere between eight and 12 hours each week. What can you be doing? Well, you could be doing the, the weekly homework tests. You can rewatch these lessons. The, there will be videos available both through OLEARN and on YouTube. You can read the lecture notes or the slides, which I will make available through OLEARN. The lecture notes have lots of exercises in them. You can solve these to prepare for the exams. You can assume that your exam questions will be of a similar style and a similar difficulty to the exercises in the lecture notes. So if you can solve all of the problems in the lecture notes, then you'll do okay in the exams. And these exercises in the lecture notes, I think most of these exercises have solutions in the back of the lecture notes. There is a discussion board through OLEARN. You can ask questions to me or you can ask, discuss with other students. If you want to help each other to understand the topic, then that can help you as well. Um, if you have a question for me, you can either send it by email or post it on the discussion board. But I will say, if your question is not private and it's not urgent, I would prefer you use the discussion board because other students might benefit from the answer that I give to you. You might want to read books on this topic, or you might want to watch online videos from other teachers. Let me suggest two good books. These are not required purchases. You don't have to buy these, but they might help you if you're struggling with a topic in the lessons. The first one is Voices Elementary Differential Equations and Boundary Value Problems by Boyce, Supreme and Mead. The second good book which I recommend is 
elementary differential equations with boundary value problems by Edwards and Penny. In past years, we've used both of these as required texts. This, this term, you don't have to buy the book if you don't want to, but it might help you. You may have noticed that at the bottom corner of the slide, there's a slide number. This will give you an idea as to how close to the end of the lesson we are. And if you're following along in the lecture notes, you can find the section number and section title at the top, so you know roughly where you're looking in the lecture notes. Now I want to give an introduction to differential equations. If I gave you a problem, solve x plus 3 is equal to 5, then the answer I'm looking for is some number x which satisfies this equation. But if I say solve dy dx is equal to 2x, then this time I don't want a number. This time, I want a function y of x, which satisfies this equation. A differential equation is just an equation which contains a derivative. This equation, dy dx is equal to 2x, contains a derivative. So it's an equation with a derivative, so this equation is called a differential equation. First example. Solve dy dx is equal to 2x. This equation is actually easy to solve. We, know, we can use first year calculus. First of all, we know that dy dx is the integral of the derivative of y. So this is the integral of 2x dx, and this is an easy integral. We know that this is x squared plus c x squared plus c is the solution to this differential equation. Another problem. Solve dy dx is equal to 2x and y of 0 is equal to 5. In this problem, we have two conditions. The first line is our differential equation, dy dx is equal to 2x. We looked at this in the previous example. But now we have another condition. The second line, y of 0 is equal to 5, is called an initial condition. The whole problem together, that's the differential equation and the initial condition, is called an initial value problem. And I'm going to be writing this as IVP a lot. IVP is always initial value problem. It means a problem like this differential equation and one or more initial conditions. We've already solved the differential equation. We know that the solution to the differential equation is x squared plus c. So the first one, done. But we also need to solve, we also need to satisfy the second condition. We need to choose the value of c so that y is 0 is equal to 5. So what we're going to do is we're going to calculate, and I'm starting with the initial condition, but just instead of y of 0 is equal to 5, I've just changed it around to 5 equal to y of 0. We have a formula for y of x. y of x is x squared plus c. Therefore, y of 0 must be 0 squared plus c. 0 squared plus c or c. Therefore, the constant c must be equal to 5. Therefore, the solution to this initial value problem is x squared plus 5. This is the unique function which satisfies the differential equation and the initial condition. Another one, solve dy dx is equal to sine x with the initial condition y of 0 is equal to 3. First, we're going to solve the differential equation, and then we're going to choose the correct value of c. 
we can start as we did before. Y of x is the integral of the derivative of y. The integral of sine x dx is minus cos x plus c. Then we just need to choose the correct value of c such that y is 0 is equal to 3. So 3 is equal to y of 0. We have our formula for y of x. This must be minus cos 0 plus c or minus 1 plus c. And we find that c must be equal to 4. This is all we needed to do. So we can, then we can write down the answer. The solution to this initial value problem is minus cos x plus 4. Another differential equation which looks easy, but actually isn't. Solve dy dx is equal to y. This is a harder problem to solve. You can't just integrate dy dx to find this solution. We're going to need a new method, and I'm going to show you how to do that later today. I want to run through some examples from science. Many problems in engineering, science, and the social sciences can be modeled using differential equations. I want to start with three easy examples. First example is the example of a falling object. Let's suppose we have some objects of mass 10 kilograms, and let's suppose that the object is falling downwards. We can ask what forces act on the object. There's gravity, which pulls the object downwards. And there's drag, which pulls the object up. Gravity will make the object try to move faster. Gravity will slow the object down. We need to talk about units before we go on. For the velocity of the object, and the velocity, the downwards velocity, I want to use meters per second. And for time, I want to use seconds. V of t will be the velocity, t will be the time in seconds. Newton's second law says force is equal to mass times acceleration. The mass is 10 kilograms, and the acceleration is the derivative of velocity. So force must be equal to 10 dv dt. Let's just talk about units again. Note that acceleration, dv dt, v is measured in meters per second, t is meters, measured in seconds, so acceleration is measured in meters per second, divided by seconds or meters per second squared. Now, back to the picture. Force, we have gravity. Gravity is moving in, pointing in the same direction as velocity. So this is positive plus gravity. Drag is pointing in the opposite direction from the velocity. So drag is going to be a negative force. On the Earth, the gravity on an object of mass 10 kilograms is approximately 10 g, where g is the constant 9.8 meters per second squared. The drag is reasonable to assume, as long as the object isn't traveling too quickly, the drag is proportional to velocity. There is a symbol for proportional, but this symbol here means is proportional to. Is proportional to means is equal to a constant multiplied by. So we're to assume that drag is equal to some constant gamma multiplied by velocity, where gamma is some positive number which depends on the shape of an object. What does it mean? It means if we have some streamlined object, then gamma is going to be a small number. If we have some object like a parachute, which is streamlined, we expect to have lots of drag, we expect gamma to be a big number. For our example, let's just put a number in to make this a little bit easier. Let's suppose that for our object, gamma is two kilograms per second. We put these numbers into, our, into the equation we had before. 
Mass times acceleration is equal to force, which is gravity minus drag, or 10g minus gamma v. And using these numbers, that's 98 minus 2v. Divide by 10, we get the differential equation. dv dt is equal to 9.8 minus v over 5. And I'm going to be calling this equation 1. This is 98. It's 10 multiplied by 9.8. This one is 9.8. We're going to solve equation 1 later today. First, I want to use a direction field to try to understand um, what is happening with this equation. A direction field is a grid of arrows, in this case in the TV plane, which shows the slope of solutions to differential equation. Direction field for equation one looks like this. We have this grid of arrows. The arrows tell us where the solution is sloping down, where the solution is sloping up. I'm going to show you how to draw direction fields later. But first, I want to why did we divide by five? Okay, so on the left side I have a ten, on the right side I have two. Divide by ten, I get two divided by ten, which is the same as one divided by five. Where was I? I'm going to show you how to draw a direction field like this later. But first, I want to understand what we what can we find about the solutions just from looking at the direction field. Let's suppose, just for example, that we start at y0 is equal to 54. In other words, let's suppose we start just here. The arrow says we should go downwards. So if we draw this, we go from 54, we go down a bit. Then we look at the next arrows. The arrows say we should be sloping this way. Keep going down. We should be sloping a little bit and like this. Just from looking at these arrows, we can guess that the solution looks something like this. I can use a computer to um, do better than this. This is one of the solutions. We can draw some more solutions. If we start at different points on the v-axis and then follow the arrows, we can guess at some more solutions. Note that all of these solutions follow the arrows. The arrows tell us which solution to draw how to draw the solution. And we expect that somewhere in the middle, there should be a constant solution. We can calculate this. Note that if V is equal to 45, then dV dt is 9.8 minus 49 divided by two, which is 9.8 minus 9.8 or zero. So V of t equal to 49 is a constant solution which we also call an equilibrium solution. Next example. Now let P of T denote the population of a mice in an area where time T is going to be measured in months. First, we're going to assume that there's plenty of food for the mice to eat. So if nothing eats the mice, we expect Pt to increase at a rate proportional to p. If there's lots of mice, then that means there's lots of baby mice, and p increases. If there's not many mice, then not many baby mice, p increases slowly, etc. We expect dp dt is proportional to p. That means we're expecting dp dt is equal to some constant r multiplied by p, where r is some positive number. And just to make this a little bit easier, let's put a number in. Let's suppose that r is equal to 0 
five per month. So we have the PDT is equal to P over two. However, let's suppose that five owls also live in this area. And let's suppose that each owl eats three mice each day. We can calculate one owl eats three owl, three mice per day. So five owls eat 15 mice per day. And we assume that there are 30 days in a month. The five owls eat 450 mice every month. So we can change our differential equation to dp dt is equal to p over 2 minus 450. The p over 2 is how many baby mice are born each month. The minus 450 is how many mice die each month because they're eaten by owls. If we look at the direction field for this equation, we can guess at some solutions. Here they are. Just by following the arrows, we can draw some solutions. If we start at 900, we have an equilibrium or constant solution. If we start higher than 900, the solution will increase. If we start at less than 900, it means more mice are being killed every day than are being each month than are being born. So the, the number of mice will decrease. And a third example, let's talk about a cup of coffee. Newton's law of cooling states that the temperature of an object changes at a rate proportional to the difference between its temperature and that of its surroundings. But if we have hot coffee in a cold room, the coffee will cool quickly. If you have lukewarm coffee in a lukewarm room there or in a warmish room i should say then the coffee will cool slowly i want to suppose that the temperature of your cup of coffee obeys newton's law of cooling let's suppose that to start with the coffee has 90 degrees and let's suppose that the temperature of, the, of your room is 20 degrees Write the differential equation for the temperature of your coffee. We expect the cup of coffee to cool like this. At the start, there's a big difference between the temperature of the coffee and the temperature of the room, so we expect the coffee to cool quickly. Later on, the coffee will be not much warmer than the room. We expect the coffee to then cool slowly. Let capital K denote the temperature of the coffee in degrees centigrade and let T be time measured in minutes. And by Newton's law of cooling, we know that dK dt is proportional to the difference between the room and the temperature of the coffee. It follows that dK dt is some constant R multiplied by 20 minus K. Because hot cold... down and cold coffee, ice coffee warms up, we can understand that R must be a positive number. Those are three simple examples of where differential equations might come in physics or uh, biology. Section 1.3 is about how to draw a direction field. I've already given you some direction fields, but now I want to explain how we can draw a direction field. Before I go on, I want to explain what the arrows mean. I've drawn lots of linear functions, y is equal to mx. For example, y is equal to 0x, y is equal to half x, y is x, etc. We know that y is equal to 0 has slope dy dx is equal to 0. We know that 
if y is equal to a half x, the slope is equal to a half. y is equal to x has slope y is equal to y. Whenever we calculate dy dx and we find a number, we're going to be drawing an arrow like this. All of our arrows will point to the right. If the dy dx is a positive number, the arrow will be pointing upwards. If dy dx is a negative number, the arrow will be pointing downwards. And the slope of the arrow will tell us how the solution is changing. So, for example, draw a direction field for dy dx is equal to x plus y. I'm going to start with a lattice of points, and I want to draw an arrow on every one of these dots. So let me count one, two, three, ten. On this picture, I'm going to be drawing 121 arrows. First, I'm going to be calculating some values of dy dx, and then I'm going to plot those arrows. First of all, if we say x is 0, y is 0, we'll put these in the equation. 0 plus 0 is 0. dy dx is equal to 0. So I draw a horizontal arrow at the point 0, 0. I could look at the point 1, 0, x is 1, y is 0, put these numbers into the equation, dy dx is 1 plus 0, or 1. 1 means sloping upwards with slope 1. I might look at 2, 0, dy dx is 2, I have an upwards sloping arrow, but this time it's sloping more steeply, and so on. At minus 1, 0, the arrow slopes downwards. At 0, 1, I have this arrow which slopes up with slope 1. At 0, minus 1, dy dx is minus 1. At point 1, 1, dy dx is 1 plus 1 or 2. The arrow slopes up with slope 2 and so on. I have plotted 10 of the 121 arrows that I want to draw. I don't want to spend my time calculating the derivative of every single dot. I want to use a shortcut. We'll clean this up a little bit. These are the 10 arrows we've drawn so far. We're going to look for patterns of these arrows and we're going to make guesses for the rest of the arrows. First of all, look at these arrows that I've highlighted. All of these arrows are horizontal arrows because the derivative is equal to zero. It's reasonable to assume that all of the arrows in this line would be the same. It's reasonable to assume that we can fill in these arrows like this. We can look at Yes, the steepness of the arrow depends on the derivative, dy dx. We can look at these arrows along this horizontal line. We have slope minus 1, slope 0, slope 1, slope 2. Looks like as we go along this line from the left to the right, these arrows are rotating anticlockwise. Again, we can make a guess. We can make the guess that all of the arrows on this line behave the same way. And we can guess that the arrows look like this. Or we might look at one of a vertical line. We could look at any vertical line, but let's just say we look at this vertical line. As we go up this column from the bottom to the top, Again, it looks like the arrows are rotating anti-clockwise. So we can make a guess, we can fill in the arrows like this. Carrying on this way, carrying on making guesses, we can draw all 121. And the solution looks like this. And we can do this in just a few minutes. 
another example for you. Draw a direction field for dy dx is equal to xy. If you're re-watching the video, I suggest you pause at this point and have a go at this, and then press play again and check the answer. The answer is this. Or we might draw a direction field for dy dx is equal to y, x plus y. If y is equal to zero, then this is going to be equal to zero. So we can guess that horizontal arrow is all of the way across here. If x plus y is equal to zero, in other words, if y is equal to minus, then again, we're going to get a zero just here. And we expect all of the arrows to be zero. So again, across here, we'd expect slopes of zero. If we use a computer to draw it, it looks like this. Our final topic for today is I want to solve the differential equations that we talked about in section 1.2 the mice and the owls and falling objects. Both of these equations, the first one is the falling object and the second one is the mice and owls equation. These are both of the form some constant a multiplied by y minus some constant b, but with different letters instead of y. Dv dt is some constant v plus constant. Dp dt is some constant v plus some constant. We're going to study how to solve equations like this. I want to start with the mice and the owls. Solve dp dt is p divided by 2 minus 450. So to solve it, it's going to be easier if we write this as p minus 900 divided by 2. First thing to note is, as long as we can assume that p is not 900, we can rearrange the equation like this. Now, what I'm doing is I'm taking p minus 900 and I'm moving it down here, divide both sides by p minus 900, and then the dt I'm moving up to the right side. In other words, multiply both sides by dt. At this point, notice that all of the p terms, we have a p here and a p here, all of the p's are on the left, and all of the t terms, there's only one, this one here, are on the right. This is the method. We want to move all of one letter to one side of the equal sign and move all of the other letter to the other side. Now, before I go on, of course, dp dt does not really mean dp divided by dt. And the method which I'm showing you can annoy pure mathematicians who say we shouldn't do this. But this method is it works and it's easy to use. Now, here's an important point. If we can separate the variables like this, if we can move all of the p terms to the left and all of the t terms to the right, then we're allowed to integrate this equation. What I mean is we can take our equation and we can write an integral sign in front of each side. Integral of 1 divided by p minus 900 is the natural logarithm of the absolute value of p minus 900. I hope you remember your um, integrals from calculus. And easy one, the integral of a half is t over 2 plus some number, which I'm, in this case I'm going to call k. 
I want to rearrange this equation so that it looks like P is equal to something. At the top, we have what we found so far. The natural logarithm of the absolute value of P minus 900 is equal to T over 2 plus K. If we take E of each side, E of the left side is equal to E of the right side, I get the absolute value of P minus 900 is equal to E to the power T over 2 plus K. Next, I want to get rid of these absolute value signs. Absolute value is either changes a negative number to a positive number or it keeps a positive number as its positive number. Either we have plus or we have minus here. We are allowed to remove these absolute value signs as long as we add plus or minus just here. And instead of writing e to the t over 2 plus k, I choose to write this as e to the power k, e to the power t over 2. Add 900 to each side, we can move the 900 over to the right. P of t is equal to 900 plus or minus e to the power of our constant k, e to the power of t over 2. We can go a little bit further to simplify this. K is some constant, some number that we don't know yet, it's just some number. But that means e to the power of k is just some number that we don't know. So plus or minus e to the power of k is just some number that we don't know, it's just a number. We can give this unknown number a new name. Instead of writing plus or minus e to the power k, we can just give it a new name and let's say we call it small c. Then we have pt is equal to 900 plus some number small c e to the power t over 2. And this is the solution that we were looking for. Let's do another one. Solve dv dt is equal to 9.8 minus v over 5, the equation of the falling object. We can solve this using the same method. Um, I've written this all in one page. I'm going to go through this. So, first of all, we start with the differential equation. Dv dt is 9.8 minus v over 5, and I want to rearrange this. First, I'm writing this as 49 minus v divided by 5. And then I'm going to separate the variables. First of all, the 49 minus v, I'll move to the left side and the ddt i want to move to the right side but there's one point here i'm keeping a minus sign on the left and i'm changing the order of v and 49 and i'm doing it this way because I'm, this, this is going to be easier to integrate we don't need to worry about minus signs when we integrate if we can integrate with a one just here, plus one, then it's easy to integrate. Now, note what we have. We have a v term here. I have a v term just here. All of the v terms are on the left. And I have a t term here on the right. I've separated the v terms from the t terms. All of the v terms are on the left all of the t terms on the right. If we can do this, and only if we can separate the variables like this, then now to integrate the equation. I can add an integral sign on the left and an integral sign on the right. The 
the integral of dv divided by v minus 49, because I have my one at the front, is the natural logarithm of the absolute value of v minus 49. And the integral of minus one over five, this is the integral, minus t over five plus some number k. Take the exponential of both sides. So we remove the natural logarithm and we have an exponential on the right. We get the absolute value of v minus 49 is equal to e to the power minus t over five plus k. We can remove the absolute value signs if we add a plus or minus in front of the right side. And then we can take 49 over to the right. So we get 49 plus or minus e to the power k e to the power minus t over 5. To finish, we use the same trick that we used before. Let me finish this and then I'll go through the whole thing again. Instead of writing plus or minus e to the power k, we can just give this a new name and write c. Okay, back to the beginning. It's worth talking through the whole method again. We're going to be using this method quite a few times. I'm starting with 9.8 minus v over 5. And I choose to write this as 49 minus v over 5. Because 9.8 multiplied by 5 is 49. key step, the most important step here, is to separate the variables. All of the v terms I want to be on the left, and all of the t terms I want to be on the right. So I rearrange this by moving v minus 49 over to the left side, divide both sides by v minus 49, by v minus 49 and I want to move the d, 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 dt term over to the right so what I'm going to do is I'm then going to multiply both sides by t and we get dv divided by v minus 49 is equal to minus 1 over 5 dt. As I said before, the reason I've kept the minus sign on the right is just to make the integral a little bit easier. If you wanted to, you can move the minus sign over to the left, but then perhaps your integral would be, would be slightly more difficult. I've separated the variables. All of the V terms are on the left, all of the T terms are on the right. If we can separate the variables like this, then we are allowed to integrate the equation. We're allowed to integrate the left side and integrate the right side. For the rest of the calculation, it's calculating integral and then rearranging this using the method I showed before until we get the solution. Vt is equal to some function of t. The solution to this differential equation is Vt is equal to 49 plus some constant c e to the power minus t over 5. You should now be able to calculate the solution to dt. Example which I gave in the first section. Yep, 
Yes, that's right. Instead of plus or minus e to the power k, which is just some number, just some number we don't know, we can give this a new name and we can just call this c. Plus or minus e to the power k is just some number that we don't know. C is just some number that we don't know. Instead of writing it in the complicated form, we can just give it a new letter. Just plus C is just an easier way to write this. And this is the end of today's lesson. I'm now ready to answer your questions. Okay, so because this is the end of the lesson, if you don't have questions, you're welcome to leave or you're welcome to stay to see if other people have questions. This week there will not be homework. The first question I will open next week and then you'll have seven days. So that means the deadline for the first homework is 14 days from now. Um, videos of the Laplace transform, the second part of the Laplace transform from last year, which is uh, I think at the moment only in OLAN. If you want to watch it, I can upload it to YouTube for you to watch. Okay, this sometime later today or tomorrow, the video of this lesson will be online. I'll send an announcement with the links for you. We're going to use OLEARN for homework. There will be multiple choice questions, multiple choice tests every week. The first one will be next week. The first one will be available to you next Thursday, and then you will have seven days to complete it. So the deadline that means the deadline for the first homework is in 14 days. Okay, I'm going to take a five minute break and then I'll come back to see if there's any more questions. You can either wait five minutes to ask questions to me or you can ask questions in the discussion board. You're welcome to leave now if you want and then I'll see you next week. <laughs>